Hope you guys are ready to receive. Can I have an amen? Amen. amen. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Man, how about that worship team? We love you guys so much. You guys are just incredible. But in 1 Samuel chapter 10, I want to give a little introduction here. This message is kind of a life message for me. You know, we moved here uh, almost 24 years ago to plant Celebration Church with a team. And these are some of the things that have kept me in the race, guys. I'm just excited to bring some of these principles to you. These, these are some thoughts, some things from the Lord that he's downloaded to me that's kept me going. Can I have an amen? Who wants to finish the race strong? Amen. First Samuel chapter 10, verse 26 says this, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and valiant men went with him, whose hearts God has touched. You can underline that your Bibles, whose hearts God has touched. Has there ever been a time where God touched your heart? In a significant way, it wasn't emotionalism, it, it wasn't willpower, it was when the Spirit of the Lord came and touched your heart, and you were changed. Maybe it was this morning, maybe, maybe for the first time God's touched your heart, maybe you're watching online and God is touching your heart with the power of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing like it. Look down in chapter 11. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. Because when God touches your heart, you're changed. But something significant happens. You know what's happening? You are switching kingdoms. You are coming into his kingdom. I remember years ago, in fact, it was 30 years ago, the first time God touched my heart, and I made a decision to follow Jesus with all of my heart, I was changed. It was real. It was significant for me. But you know what happens? There's a new soldier in God's army. You're a part of a new family. God has a new son. He has a new daughter in his family. There's a battle of kingdoms that's happening, and you just came to the other side. Can I have an amen? In chapter 11, it says this, Then Nahash, come on everybody say Nahash. Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. Jabesh Gilead is just a town. So this guy named Nahash is fighting against these people from Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. Instead of fighting, they try to cut a deal. This is what's so interesting about this passage to me. Nahash means serpent in the Hebrew. And so God's people, they're, 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 they're going into a war. And instead of fighting, this is what happens. They say this, make a covenant with us and we'll serve you. Look at what he says. Nahash means serpent. He says this, on this condition I will make a covenant with you that I may put out all of your right eyes and bring a reproach on all Israel. The enemy is trying to make a deal with God's people. He says this, I'll leave you alone if you let me put out your right eye. Why is this so significant? Because your right eye is your fighting eye. When they would go into battle, they would hold a shield with their left hand and with a sword with their right hand, and that's how they would fight. An enemy comes and says, give me your fighting eye. How many of you know the enemy still, he still wants to make that deal with us today? Give me your fighting eye and I'll leave you alone. You're too, this battle's too hard for you. Give me your fighting eye. You, can't, you won't make it. Just let me cut a deal. It's too hard for you. You won't make it long term. He still wants to cut that deal today. It's the same pattern that happens. God touches our hearts. We're in a battle now. And the enemy comes and says, just give me your fighting eye. Cut a deal with me. They would hold the shields with their left hand. They would fight with their right. Can you, can you see a whole town with one-eyed people? How degrading. Useless in battle. A, a badge of slavery. One-eyed men walking around. Think how humiliating. Think how insulting. How many of you know the enemy is sick? 
He comes to steal, kill, and destroy our life. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your emotional life. He wants to turn your finances upside down. He wants you to live in fear and not faith. He wants to take your effectiveness in God's kingdom. He wants to take our fighting eye. But we're not going to let him have it. Can I have an amen? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, the scripture says. Spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. The scripture says in 1 John, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Can you see the battle of kingdoms that's raging around us? The scripture says he's the prince of the power of the air. But aren't you glad that we serve a defeated foe? He was defeated at the cross. This is what I say. We already have the victory. We just have to recognize it. We already have the victory. We just need to walk in it. And so what I want to bring to you the next few minutes, we're starting this new series, Love Like This, but I want to bring it from a different angle. Pastor Tim has some incredible things that God's put on his heart here the next few weeks. If we are going to love like this, we've got to walk in his love for us. Amen. We first have to, I believe the love of God is the most powerful force in the universe. And the enemy wants to take our fighting out. He wants to forget about his love for us. And I want to give you five ways that we lose our fighting eye. Come on, if you're with me, say amen. amen. The first way that we lose our fighting eye is this. We compromise our convictions. We compromise our convictions. What's a conviction? It's a firmly held opinion or belief. We live in a day where hardly anyone has a strong conviction about something. A true conviction. Are you a person of conviction? Is your words your bond? Do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Who do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about the Son of God? Who is he to you? When I think about conviction, I think about this. How do you want to be remembered? What do you want to be remembered for? What are your convictions? In a postmodern society, everything is gray. It says this, there's no one-size-fits-all truth. What's your truth? What's your truth? Isaiah said this, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness. We need some people that will stand up for what they believe and not compromise their convictions. Come on, can I have a better amen than that in the house of God? I'm not talking about legalism, adherence to a set of rules, trying to earn God's favor, earn God's love to you. Love you. I'm not talking about being mean-spirited or rudely pushing your convictions on others. The scripture says they, are, they know that they're disciples by their love for one another. But I'm talking about knowing what you believe and living out what you believe. And maybe some of us have slowly began to lose some convictions that we once held strong. Things are just becoming gray. We're, what's happening? We're losing our fighting eye. The enemy's coming, and we're beginning to compromise our convictions a little bit. And I just want to encourage us today, maybe God wants to get us our spiritual edge back. Come on, a sharpness, a spiritual edge that comes with knowing what you believe and living integrity and walking out an integrated life. What you say is who you are. Your, your behavior is integrated with what you believe. The second way that we lose our fighting eye is we live in regret. Oh, the enemy loves regret. Isaiah 43 18 says this, it's supposed to be 18, I messed up, that's not their fault. Isaiah 43, 18 says this, do not dwell in the past. Could, could the scriptures be more clear? Could the Lord make it any more clear? You could circle the word dwell, Isaiah 43, 18, do not dwell 
in the past. We all make mistakes. How many of you know Christians make mistakes? We all drop the ball. Dads make mistakes. We say things we don't mean. We do things we wish we didn't do. We don't do things we wish we would have done. Moms make mistakes. Teenagers make some mistakes every once in a while. (laughs) We all make mistakes, but the enemy wants to take those mistakes and turn them into regret. And he wants to do what I call create a past-focused stronghold. He wants us to live in shame and condemnation and take our fighting eye. Instead of bold, faith-filled prayers, he wants our prayer life to turn into shame management and defeat. He wants to use condemnation to keep us from coming to God. Let me tell you, friends, this is what I've learned. If you feel like you can't come to God, you're too, you've messed up too bad, that's just when you need to come to him the most. Man, I'm telling you, l- listen, Jesus, he's, it says this, he's gentle and lowly in heart. Come to him and you'll find rest for your souls. He says this, he who comes to me, I will never reject. It's a scripture. He says this in John six thirty seven. However, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. King James Version says, I will never cast them out. Come on, get that's the heart of the Father. You know that Jesus is the expressed image of the Father. That's Jesus' heart. I don't know how you think about Jesus. If He's a hard taskmaster. He's in heaven waiting to punish you, man. He loves you. And you can always come to Jesus. He's gentle and lowly at heart. You'll find rest for your souls. That's our Savior. Amen? But the enemy wants us to live in regret. He wants to take our fighting eye. He wants us to dwell on the past. But the scripture says this, do not dwell on the past. Let me teach you something about the past. Some of us are more nostalgic than others. Some of us are tempted to live in the past. Let me give you something I got from a psychiatrist one time. I thought this was good. I had to share it with you today. He told me this. He said, live 60% of your thinking for today, live in the present, live 20% of your thinking in the past to learn from your mistakes, but don't dwell there, and spend 20% of your thinking for vision for the future. Man, I would write that down. That's pretty good. You find yourself living 90% of the past, something's wrong. You're, you're, You're living in the past. And so Apostle Paul said it this way, Brethren, I do not count myself to have, ap- to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Come on, are y'all with me today? One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the prize for the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead, toward the goal, for the prize of what kind of call? An upward call of God in Christ Jesus, not a backwards call. Can I have an amen? But the enemy wants us to do this. He wants us to rehearse the past over and over in our mind. Just rehearsing, rehearsing the past. Rehearsing. Sometimes we have to just, and what, here's what he does. He wants to do, he wants to create what I call a past focus stronghold. I've counseled a lot of people in my life, and I, I certainly don't have all the answers for anyone's life, not even mine most of the time. But here's what I can tell you keep moving forward in God. The best counseling advice I can give you is to keep moving forward in the Lord. Amen. Because a past-focused stronghold breeds powerless and and depression. A past-focused stronghold breeds powerlessness and depression. That's how the enemy wants to take your fighting eye. If he can get you living in the past, living in regret, you know what happens? When we're stuck in the past, our movement in the Lord is stopped. 
Satan comes to us from the past, and he would have us to live there. The Lord comes to us in the, fu- in the present with hope for the future. Satan comes to us from the past. Come on, I'm preaching now. Satan comes to us from the past and would have us to live there. The Lord comes to us in the present with hope for the future. A past-focused stronghold has to be broken off our life. Some of you are stuck in that. I've been stuck in it before. Refuse to wallow in the past. Meditate on God in the present, not the hurts and disappointments and failures of the past. We want to ask why. We want an explanation. God wants to give us a revelation of himself his faithfulness to us. We may never understand. Let me show you how to break a past-focused stronghold. The first way is to give your emotional baggage to God. And that's one of the wonderful things about a Sunday morning worship service here in the house of God, because you can put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You can take the the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, the oil of joy for mourning. And it's, it, listen, you can give your emotional baggage to God and a, a touch from him can just change your heart and your life. That's his, in his presence is fullness of joy. A transaction can take place. How do you know that you're not there yet? You're still mad or you're still sad. How do you know if you're there? You're still mad or you're still sad. You've got a past focus stronghold. Two ways to break a past focus. Give your emotional badge to God. Believe that God is in control and he can redeem your life. He can redeem your mistakes and he can redeem the mistakes of others. He's always working. There's always two layers to our story. There's what we can see and then there's what God is doing behind the scenes. Despite the physical reality of what we see, God is always able to work pain and mistakes for his good. He can take every trial and make us stronger and wiser and give us a deeper revelation of him. Amen? And so the third way we lose our fighting eye, come on, are you still with me? Say amen. Amen. Disappointment causes emotional pain. And we're tempted to live in fear and not in faith. Disappointment. To miss an appointment. You thought you were going to get this job when you graduated from college. And it didn't work out. You thought you were going to marry this person. But y'all broke up. You thought you were going to be doing this your entire life, and now things look radically different. COVID-19, the pandemic, things look so different. Disappointment. You missed an appointment that you thought you were going to have. And what happens when we have disappointment in our life? We have this expectation about something. It leads to emotional pain, loss. And pain is real. Emotional pain is real. You have a health problem. You or a loved one experience a health problem and your world is turned upside down. And here's what happens. We live to never be disappointed again. Can you see how the enemy wants to take your fighting eye? He wants you to live in, he wants you to compromise your convictions. He wants you to live in regret with a past focused stronghold as, this is what I learned about that. When you live in regret and you're rehearsing the past, you just lost a day. You do it all day, you just lost that day. He just took it from you. Can you see how he takes your fighting eye? The problem with being disappointed, which we all face disappointments in life, and then the, and dealing with the emotional pain, is we live to never be disappointed again. We certainly may need a season to heal and recalibrate, but we can't live there. Because the scripture says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The problem is there's no advancement. 
The problem is you're stuck. And this is what happens. He takes your fighting eye. You lose your eternal perspective. You're just trying to survive in life. And what I've learned is eternal perspective is a mark of spiritual maturity. Now you're just trying to survive. You're losing your eternal perspective. We no longer live for the kingdom. We're just trying to survive. Can you see how he takes our fighting eyes, guys? Look at this. We sell our birthright for a cup of stew, like Jacob. We're just trying to survive. We just want quick hits. We're just trying to get our emotional fix to make it. The enemy's got us, friends. He's getting exposed this morning. Can I have an amen? amen. If, we, if we're going to keep our fighting eye, we have to learn to bring God into our pain. Because pain is common to man. It's universal. Man, I don't know about you, but it just seems like the last few years, guys, Anybody else? Is it just me? Anybody else just seen more pain, experienced more emotional pain? Am I the only bald-headed pastor that's experienced some of that? Pain is common to man, but listen, when we experience pain, God opens up our hearts. We're more, our hearts are more pliable. He can get into the deepest places of our soul. Pain is common to man. Pain is universal. But what we do with it, what we let it teach us about life and ourselves can determine the trajectory of our lives and our walk with God. We can suffer towards the Lord or we can suffer away from the Lord. Pain makes some bitter and some sweet. It's not the event, but what we do with the event, how we process it, what narrative do we believe about the event, about what happened? And some meet pain and rejection and are overcome by it, and others meet pain and rejection and overcome it with God's love. We have no control over what happens to us. Will it bring me closer to God? Will it ultimately make me more joyful, more useful, more full of life, more spiritually alive? We have no control over what happens to us, but we can control how we let it affect us. Don't deal with pain on a human level. Bring God into your pain and let him turn your suffering into wholeness. Our pain must be connected to a purpose. Can you see how the enemy wants to take our fighting eye? Our pain must be connected to a purpose. Jesus experienced unimaginable pain on the cross, but his pain, he says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus' pain was connected to a purpose. His pain wasn't senseless, and my pain's not senseless, and your pain's not senseless. It's connected to a call and a purpose in our lives. Amen. Come on, if you're still with me, say amen. amen. We compromise our convictions. We live in regret. Disappointment causes emotional pain, and we get stuck in fear and not faith. The enemy takes our fighting eye. The fourth way we lose our fighting eye is this. We put down our swords. You know, Ephesians 6, man, sometimes when you've been in church a long time, somebody says, Ephesians 6, you just like close your Bible. You're like, uh-oh, here we go. It's the armor of God. I learned that in Sunday school. Here's the thing about the armor of God. It's not optional. Paul didn't say, hey, if you want to, take the armor of God up may want to put it on if you feel good today. No, the armor of God has to become something, that a habit in our life. It has to become a part of who we are. 
Because the scripture says, finally, my brethren, be strong, the Lord, and the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be to quench all the fiery darts of the devil, the helmet of salvation. And listen, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so the enemy, what happens if you put your sword down, is now you're living on the defensive you, you, your weapon's down. You may have a shield. You got the helmet on. You got a belt of truth on. Your, your, your feet are shod for the preparation of the gospel of peace, but you don't have a weapon. Come on now. You put your sword down, and you're wondering why you can't fight. I'll tell you, friends, this is what keeps you in the race. I'm telling you guys. Let me, let, let me give you something. All, the scripture says, the Bible says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It says this, for the word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and mars and a disorder of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yeah. Hey, let me show you something about the, let me show you something about the Bible. What if you looked at the Bible like this? What if you came to your scriptures you have it on your phone, you have it wherever. But when you open the scriptures and you know that they're sacred, and you know that in him, in the scriptures is, is how Jesus is revealed to us, and you came to the scriptures as an altar. What if you came, what if when on your phone, what if you came to the scriptures as an altar? And when you open the scriptures, it was to, it was to, hear and experience the presence of the Lord. What if you saw the scriptures like that? Would it change something? They're living and powerful, the Bible says. We never graduate from God's school. Man, when I was, when I was a kid, I didn't know a scripture, friends. I was 21 years old. I told about I didn't know the difference between Noah and Moses. But here's what I did. I said, I, I, I'm going to make a decision to be a lifetime student of the word of God. And I'm, I'm going to put some passion into my, my relationship with the scriptures. Now, we're all different, and a lot of us don't like to read. I know people don't like to read. That's okay. That's how God made you. But you need a relationship with the scriptures because I'm telling you, friends, this is what keeps you in the race. There's something super and about, supernatural about connecting to the scriptures and your walk with God. Why? It's your spirit sword. The scripture says this in Revelation 1, out of his mouth came a double-edged sword. That's the Lord Jesus. Taking the sword of the spirit with which you can fight. Well, that's how you fight, the sword of the spirit. And so some of us are just, we, we've lost our fighting out because we're malnourished. We, the, the scripture says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. Seed, which is the Word of God. So some of us haven't planted any seed. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we wonder why our fighting eye is getting lost. The last way that the enemy takes our fighting eye is that we forget about the grace of God and His love for us. We're in this series, Love Like This. I can tell you why I'm, I'm still in the race is because of his love for me. That's why I'm still here. We can't let the enemy take our fighting eye and rob us of walking in his love for us. The scripture says this, Paul wrote, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in, in what? In my weakness. When he is, when I'm weak, he's strong. This is a scripture in Romans 8 that has been just a, a lifetime passage for me. And it says this, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. How? Through him who does what? Through him who loves us. How are we more than conquerors? How do we, through him 
who loves us. It says this, for I am persuaded. Come on, are you persuaded? Paul, when he wrote this passage, he was persuaded. He says this, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. <laughs> he says this, nor any other created thing, height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall do what? It's like Paul just says, I can't think of anything else to write. I'm just to write everything I can think of. And then he says, anything that's created, everything that's created, he says this, I'm persuaded that no matter what, death, life, height, death, demons, nothing can do what? Separate us from what? The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how we keep our fighting eyes because we know that we're his beloved. If, hey guys, if we could just see ourselves as the Father sees us, then we would love like him. Look, in Romans 8, we're closing with this. You guys can stand. In Romans 8, this passage, the first thing Paul says is this. He says, there's no condemnation. He says, who can condemn us? Christ Jesus the Lord. So first he says, there's no condemnation. And then he says, there's no separation. There's no condemnation. There's no separation. Come on, let's say that together. No condemnation. No separation. Come on, no condemnation. No separation. Come on, say it one more time. No condemnation. And there's no separation. This is what he's saying. Nothing on the outside can separate us from what's happening on the inside. Come on, think about it for a second. Nothing on the outside can separate what's happening to me on the inside. I'm always a son. I'm always a, his daughter. I'm persuaded, fully persuaded, that I'm more than conquerors through him who loves me. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna pray, first I wanna pray if you're here today and you just feel far from God, maybe you came in the arena here or one of our campuses you're watching online and you feel far from God, I want to give you a chance to get your life right with the Lord, to come to Him. He's gentle and lowly and hard. If that's you, if you'd say, Pastor Chris, I, I just need to make a fresh start with God today. Just lift a hand up. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? I need to get my life right with God today. Anybody else? Those watching online, those at the campuses, come on, let's, let's just lead them in a prayer. Father, we just thank you for these. And if you raise your hand, or maybe even if you didn't, you can just repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I turn away from my old ways, my old life, and I come to the cross. Thank you for making me a new creation. I commit to following you with all of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together for them.